It's great to uh, have back on the program today, Douglas Rushkoff, who's a media theorist, professor at Cooney Queens College, and also author of the new book, Survival of the Richest Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires, which I recently read and very much enjoyed. Really great having you on today. I appreciate it. Uh, it's good to see you. So the kind of jumping off point of the book is that you are invited by some billionaires uh, to meet with them. And the meeting sort of goes a little bit differently, maybe they, than you anticipated, where they want advice, not so much about the technology of how to survive a possible impending mass catastrophic event, but more sort of like sociocultural and psychological questions about like, how do I prevent my security force from turning against me and sort of like taking all my food and, and kind of this type of thing. And one of the big points you make in the book, which I find interesting, is that these billionaires are now looking to sort of insulate themselves from the consequences of the very system that they used to enrich themselves in the first place. Talk first just kind of generally about this space that exists, this um, uh, uh, sort of catastrophe and disaster planning space. And is it only billionaires or is it also like the hundred millionaires that are into this? And it give us a sense of the lay of the land. Well, it's interesting. I mean, these guys, in some ways, these guys give a bad name to preppers everywhere. Mm. You know, I, I've met a lot of preppers since doing this book and real preppers are generally involved in strengthening their communities. They understand that, that when you have community resilience, when you've got local farms, when you've supported that, you're going to everyone's going to do better. And these guys are not are not preppers in that sense. They've got such a go it alone, you know, self-sovereign individual, you know, extreme libertarian understanding of technology and money and identity that they um with or without catastrophe, they want a private island. They want a little seasteading raft of their own. They want their own country, <laughs> their own government, you know, their own social network, their own virtual womb, you know, that could that can care for them. So, uh, oddly enough, I started to look at their disaster prep and uh, catastrophe mindset more as a way of justifying what they've been doing all along. You know, there's, there's, I just read a piece by Cory Doctorow about Epson printers yep. and how Epson makes a printer that bricks itself after it prints out a certain number of pages. It just bricks itself. And there's no really good reason for it, but, except that they want to sell another printer, you know, and they justify it that, oh, well, the parts are going to be worn out by then. So we, we spare the user the hassle of, of having a broken printer and we just <laughs> lock it, you know, but there's a guy. Right. There's and I'm assuming it's a guy. There's a guy at Epson printers somewhere thinking, well, yes, this means I'm going to have to send some more kids into the mines in Africa to get the rare earth metals to make another printer. And yes, we're going to have to take that existing printer and just chuck it onto a landfill where it's going to leach toxic chemicals. And yes, I am actually shortening the amount of time between now and whatever catastrophic climate event takes down our civilization. But the margin I'm making selling these extra printers must be making me enough money so I can get my kid to a Rudolf Steiner school and get a goat share and live in a private farm somewhere and be insulated from this, that I can stay that much ahead. And that's really what it's always been. These guys with an exit strategy mentality needing to stay just one or two steps ahead of the rest of the investors so they can get out with their carpet bag before the thing comes down. Yeah. And in the book, you, you refer to the mindset, which I think incorporates some some of these ideas that you're talking yeah. about here. You know, one of the things that I I've read is, you know, the prepper, the, the sort of like normal preppers and then the, the billionaires you're talking about here and then like everybody else, whatever. Some of the advice I've read kind of is summarized as follows, which is, listen, it makes sense to plan for like a 10 to 14 day cataclysm of some kind, food, water, maybe electricity with a generator, you know, that, that, that makes sense. Beyond that, it is so truly difficult to really set yourself up to survive what we might call long term in such an event that it's not even really worth thinking about. That is increasingly something right. I'm reading from a lot of these right. folks. 
But when you say that, though, yeah. the implication of that, and that's what I, the implication of that is that means that becoming a billionaire, even without the catastrophe, is not the way to make yourself the most safe and resilient overall. Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so I guess when is it that the billionaires think that doesn't apply to them because of the amount of money that they have? It's that the billionaires are aware that they've spent the last 10 or 20 years of their lives externalizing so much harm to the rest of the world that they are afraid of it coming back at them like karma. You know, most of these guys, they are unconscious tech bro billionaires for the first 10 or 20 years. And then they go down to Burning Man and do some ayahuasca and realize, Oh my God, the planet is crying out to me. She's dying. You know, they have the same realization, but then on the G5 back to San Jose, they're like, okay, now <laughs> how do I protect myself from her? <laughs> like the angry girlfriend that you haven't called in a long time. The planet you know, is coming for revenge. So uh, the question that I found really interesting from the book, which I already mentioned, is this idea of I, I can do everything right as a billionaire with every resource available to me. But if we really get to a cataclysm, my security team might just turn against me and be like, let's kill this one guy and we can keep all the food and we can survive. You talk in the book about, well, the, the way to preempt that is probably to for the years leading up to this event, build uh, relationships and, and cooperate and, you know, make it so that they would see you as one of them, so to speak, and not right. not try to do that. Is that really are they satisfied with that advice? No, because they understand what that advice is, is really a Trojan horse to try to break down their mentality. Mm. Right. I said to them at that at that talk, I said, well, may, the way to make sure your head of security doesn't kill you in the bunker is pay for his daughter's bat mitzvah today. Right. You know, and I meant that in some ways as a as a little Jewish joke. Um, but they would have to do more than pay for that one guy's daughter's bat mitzvah. And while you're at it, think about your workers. And while you're at that, think about the people living in the community around. Think about the the if you're a Facebook executive, think about the tent village right outside corporate headquarters. Who are those people? Right. And how do you look at them not as a city problem, but as a human problem? Yeah. You know, not something to bulldoze out of there, but something to actually address and look at the actual impact of your company on the world. So if they started thinking that way, then there might not be a catastrophe for them to hide from at all. Right. But they're attached to it. Yeah. And that's partly I mean, that's really what the book looks at is how to capitalism and the history of technology and science and this kind of dominator mindset. How do they all combine to create this kind of colonial vision where all they can do is operate one level above the rest of us? You know, they kind of go from zero to one, as T Peter Thiel would say, or go meta as Zuckerberg would say, right. or do derivatives of derivatives, as a finance guy would say. It's always one level up. That's what, what Stuart Brand said back in the, the, the 70s. You know, We are as gods, and we may as well get good at it. And the tech bros have taken that as, as kind of a gospel truth. Is your sense that these folks you've talked to are more convinced that such a world-changing event is coming than other groups, or is it simply that they are more focused on using their resources to prepare themselves for it. They're more convinced, actually. And that's, you know, it's funny. After I, I wrote the first article on this book, I've gotten calls from lots and lots of people in interesting places. And one of them is a giant hedge fund, which is a, um, uh, a hedge fund that's positioned for global calamity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got a few billion dollars in there. And they showed me their PowerPoint with charts from the World Bank and the climatologists of this and like, OK, in the next 10 years, these regions will become unlivable. Ten years after that, these ones will be the only ones that have fertile soil. This is why we recommend buying land in northern Canada, Siberia, Greenland and this part of Antarctica. And it's like, oh, my God. And so if they're being pitched those kinds of things that we are not pitched and they're so realistic um, and I suppose probable, right? Because people with real money do real studies. Then, then I think they are sort of more aware of it than we are. Mm. And I think they understand that they're more causal to it 
than we are. We're just eating our food and throwing out some plastic bags occasionally and <laughs> feeling guilty that we know the recycling actually uses more energy than it would cost to make a new plastic bottle or yeah. whatever. You know, we're, but these guys, it's like, oh, no, you're doing major – you're doing things at scale. You know, and you're doing things at scale with a business model that looks at all the damage as an externality to your business. And you're aware that those externalities are growing big enough to impact your life and the lives of your kids. In the book, you talk about technology that some see maybe naively as maybe a way out of some of the problems that we've created for ourselves. Um, you talk a little bit about solar panels and electric vehicles, I think. And now I'm not sure if I'm if I'm if this is from the book or from articles you've written. But in any case, you've expressed that you are less optimistic about some of these technologies uh, being able to kind of meet our energy needs in a truly eco friendly way. I think there's a lot of legitimacy to that. Uh, the carbon footprint of solar panels, which degrade over time. And then what do we do with them? Rare earth minerals required for electric vehicle batteries. What do you do with the battery it has reached the end of its usable life, et cetera? To, maybe I'm naive, but isn't there some degree to which those are problems that can be significantly improved upon by by engineering and the technology simply improving from where it is today that will change the scale and actually make those technologies genuinely game changers, maybe not the solution, but significantly Im Im significant improvements. Oh. Moving away from fossil fuels and combustion is a necessary part of the planet planetary civilization moving toward sustainability. Okay. Saying over the next 10 years, we're gonna convert every car to an electric car and every house to a solar panel house in order to get to zero carbon emissions by 2030 is crazy. Because okay. the amount of stuff that we would dig up yeah. in order to do that, and with the amount of the factories we'd have to open to build all those cars and do all that stuff and build all those batteries would destroy us faster than anything else. So. That's my volunteer fire alarm. The, the volunteer fire department in our town is old tech. That's what we're <laughs> hearing now. They, they send that alarm and then they check their pagers to see um, where's the fire and they go. It's community, right? Right. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. Um, and they're volunteers. Um, it's gonna go one more time. They do it twice. For, like if people woke up and didn't hear how many beeps it was to know if they're active. But um, the, the, these are all great, but the amount of energy we're using now is, you know, a, a great uh, energy theorist named uh, Nate, Nate Hoggins talks about this. It's like a pulse of energy. We're not using energy in like a way. We're using like explosions of energy in order to power these cities. The, 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 you know, hundreds of thousands of years of stored energy that gets burnt in like two days is, is, you know, a, a massive and unsustainable. So uh, we we also need to reduce the amount of energy we use. You know, and that's not shockingly hard. You know, we built uh, the American landscape around the needs of the automobile industry, where people have to drive to get to work and all. So there are, there are many many ways to reduce our energy footprint, that of our of our corporations and that of our us as individuals, and it it involves. A lot of economic rejiggering, too. If you've got an oil industry that's depending on resource depletion and you've got all these pensioners who are dependent on the oil industry and are an S&P 500 or a GDP that's depending on the growth of companies that are destroying us, you kind of do have to do more than the physical reengineering of energy production, but the, the uh, code engineering of our economy. You know, and that's where it gets scary. Yeah, you mentioned GDP. So I again, I don't remember exactly where you wrote this, but I've read something you wrote about, you know, a criticism of 401ks and uh, the sort of stock market as a pyramid scheme, I think, was the analogy that that you used. I'm there's this interview I remember at some point Noam Chomsky gave where he was sort of like confronted. And I use that in, in scare quotes. He was confronted about the fact that despite all of his criticisms of all these different types of companies, um, his like retirement accounts are invested in the same, you know, kind of index funds that, that everybody uses. And his response was something like, 
Well, yeah, I mean, what you want me to keep the money under my mattress or some something along those lines? Are you, despite your view on the impossibility of indefinite growth based on GDP growth on a planet with limited resources, your criticism of 401k, et cetera, are, are you invested in the same stuff? Some. Yeah. I mean, that was the main thing. I'm in a group called Equitable Enterprise at Institute for the Future in, in uh, uh, there, like in Palo Alto. And they were talking about all these new models and all this. And that's what I brought up in the first meeting. I said, what if we all took 50 percent of our retirement savings and invested them locally or in land trusts or in other things? Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, I won't really. We've got to make structural change. That one. And I think, yeah, I know you got to make structural change and all that. But what if we, by example, did it and then encouraged everybody else to take just half of their retirement savings? Let's say we could only they kept saying it was just such a small measure. I said, what if we could only move a couple of trillion dollars into local economics? You know, what would that do? It would be massive, a massive amount of change. So, yeah, one of the main things I'm looking at is how do we. And I hate using words like scale, but how do we make it really easy for people, instead of selecting S&P index fund, to select local index billion small businesses fund? Mm. How do we invest in land trusts? You know, you're going to get different kinds of returns. You're going to end up getting dividend returns and earnings returns rather than the capital gains of selling some massively thing. You're not going to get 100x returns on uh, restoring local businesses. At least not for that long. You know, you might at the beginning as we recover a local economy. But, you know, that's what I'm looking at. So I'm looking at lots of, um, I mean, I'm invested in land trusts and uh, there's some uh, local farming uh, things, you know, funds where you, you, you lend money to farmers at a low interest rate and get it back. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, three and 4% returns as a good thing rather than a bad thing. You know, and just because I earned money doesn't mean I'm allowed to have my money be worth more later. You know, that doesn't, I can, I'll save up money for my retirement, but I also then, you know, in addition to wanting to get to, you know, just hold my money, certainly at the rate of inflation, um, I want to create a community that will support me when I'm older so I'm not entirely dependent on my cash right. to take care of me when I'm old. And that means engendering a different kind of society. And you walk around Europe, you see old people, they're living in the house with their kids. They're, they're part of the social fabric. They're out there on the stoop at night, playing with the babies and taking care of the little ones so the husband and wife can go down to the movies and the teenagers can make out over there. And these guys, it's like a, a, an interdependent society. You know, and that's what a social economy is. That's what Marx was talking about, not some big top down central government organization. He was like, no, no, no. Economics is social. It's people doing things for one another. And maybe it's not on the ledger. Maybe there's not a DAO or a blockchain keeping track of whether grandma took care of the kids for two hours. So now someone's going to give her a bath. You know, you don't need to put that on the blockchain. Last thing, just because you mentioned it, is the entire crypto thing over? No, the entire crypto thing is not over. It it may have gone through it may have gone through the dot com bust, you okay. know, the equivalent of 1999 2000. And then we'll see. You know, there was there were two possibilities after the dot com bust. We kind of got Blogger and Friendster and Napster and some interesting things, but then we also got MySpace and Facebook and Instagram and the Ucky ones won right? <laughs> Rather than the kind of pro-social creative ones. I'd be interested to see if the, the young crypto community that I'm still aware of, the, the kids who are making NFTs for good reasons, not to become millionaires, but to support their art, and the kids who are building DAOs, you know, uh, DAOs that help other people make DAOs in order to figure out the governance structure of their organization or their community. If those people win out, then um, crypto could come back in a positive way. If crypto comes back as, you know, what it was before, which is a way for assholes to speculate on, you know, abstract assets, then, you know, all is lost. The latest book is uh, Survival of the Richest Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires. We've been speaking with the book's author, media theorist and professor Douglas Rushkoff. Always great having you on. Really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate what you do.